Good morning. It's very good to see everybody today. Um, I'm really excited to talk to you a little bit about search and talk to you a little bit about Google, the evolution of search, how search works today, and the future of search. And then also talk a little bit about openness and the web. So who am I? Why am I here? Why am I in front of you? I started out working on search, as you heard earlier today, 12 years ago tomorrow. So I have one more day left before I'll be around for 12 years. I get to answer a lot of questions from webmasters, people who want to know how search engines work, how to do better in search engines. And we've made a total of over 400 different videos that have been viewed over 6.6 .6 million times. So a lot of people want to know how search engines work, how to do better on search engines, and we're excited to talk about that today. I also have a lot of ties with Korea. For example, the phone that I carry with me every single day is a Galaxy Nexus. It's a fantastic phone. I actually have two Samsung phones in my pocket right now. One's a local phone and one's for uh, the United States. And in fact, the very first car that I ever owned was a Hyundai Excel, a blue hatchback. I drove it all the way through college. It was an incredibly reliable car. I drove it all the way into grad school. I have extremely fond memories of my Hyundai Excel. Now, I know that Hyundai has made huge strides and has made even better, you know, like the Equus, right? Now, Hyundai is a luxury brand. But I have been extremely excited and proud to use Korean products for years and years and years. So what am I going to talk about today? I'd like to talk about the evolution of search, that is, the past, how search got to the way it is. I also want to talk about search today. It's important to know how search engines work. If people are interested in search engine optimization or knowing the process that Google goes through, in order to decide whether to launch a change or not. And then I'd like to talk a little bit about the future of search. What would search look like in a perfect world if you could control everything about it and make sure that you had the ideal, perfect search engine? And then I wanted to close out by talking a little bit about the importance of the open web standards and how important it is to make sure that the web is open so that everybody can benefit as a result. So let's start with the early days of search engines. One of the very first well-known search engines globally was Yahoo. And it's almost a little bit of a strangeness, a little bit unusual to call it a search engine. Because Yahoo started out as a hand-compiled list of links. So an individual person would decide what category to put things in and they would decide whether it deserved to be in a certain category or not. The problem with that is that it doesn't scale very well. You need to find a search engine that can work across the breadth of the entire web, or else it isn't going to be as useful for every kind of query that people get. And so the next generation of search engines looked at the content on the page. That is, the actual words that existed on the page. Now, whenever I joined Google, we were a startup. So there was less than 100 people whenever I joined Google. And at the time, I was worried that we would be crushed by AltaVista. Google was a little tiny company. AltaVista was a huge company. But Google had something that the other search engines at that time did not do. We looked at the links pointing to web pages. So, not just what a web page said about itself, because you might meet someone and they say that they're fantastic, they say that they're great, but if you meet someone and their friend says that they're fantastic, or you know someone who objectively says that they're great or fantastic, that means even more than if you say it yourself. So looking at links was a vital new way to discover the reputation of web pages and which web pages should count. Google also started to look at not just pay for inclusion, 
but trying to make sure that the very best pages rank in the best possible order. Back whenever Google started, it was relatively common for people to pay to be indexed in their search engine. And if you think about it, that's not a great idea. A search engine should try to be as comprehensive as possible. You shouldn't need to pay for the search engine to give you good information. So, Google has also evolved. From going from 10 blue links, as we sometimes call it, the 10 blue links referred to just the 10 search results and the links that would come out of that. Google has gotten better and better. So now, at least in the United States, we're able to return all of the information blended together according to what is the most relevant. Now, I know that in Korea, we're more likely to have segmented search. And so you'll have things in different sections. But it can be very useful at times to be able to say, first, let's see a web result. Then, let's see a video, because I've done the search Korean pop. And then, maybe a few more web results. So that sort of intelligence to figure out when you want to have a video result or an image or something that's a web result can be extremely useful. So I'd like to take just a second and talk about what the world would look like without Google. Whenever Google started out, search engine quality was not as good as it is today. So Google was one of the very first search engines that clearly marked advertisements. I remember whenever I started out at Google, I went and I talked to another company. And they had a list of results that they called featured, and they had a list that they called partner. And I said, what's the difference between a featured result and a partner result? And the company said, there's no difference at all. Everything is paid for. And that didn't seem fair at the time. So Google did a very good job of trying to mark clearly what were the ads and what was the organic, what were the editorial results. And you can't pay to get a higher ranking on Google. I'm proud that even to this day, you can't pay to get a higher ranking on Google. If there hadn't been Google, I think you would also have found more spam on the web. I don't know how far this wireless mic will work. Let's see how we can go. Even if you can read English, this might look like nonsense, like gibberish. And the fact is, it is nonsense. It is gibberish. This is something that my team works on called spam or web spam. If you see free sound effects, Puget Sound Naval Shipyard, maybe someone would type in, you know, Santa Anita VIP baseball sounds. A spammer would make these sorts of pages with the hope that if someone were to type in two or three random words from this page, a person would land on this page. And then you could show ads, or you could include malware. You could basically do something that would infect the user's computer or otherwise harm them. And so spam is a really bad thing. And before Google, there was a lot more spam on the web. Google changed the conversation in a lot of ways to think about the quality of the search results and not having spam. So I think we would have had more of it if Google hadn't taken strong action on spam. We definitely would have seen a lot more viruses and malware as well. I remember one year at Christmas, I went to visit my relatives. And has anyone had the experience where their computer was running a little bit slowly because it got infected or it had malware, spirus, you know, viruses. Any, any, anyone had that sort of experience with their computers? Maybe their parents' computers? Anything along those lines? A few people, absolutely. Well, at the time, I had just spent an entire day cleaning out my mother-in-law's computer. So out of the vacation, I had about five days off. One entire day was sent getting her computer into good shape. And I realized that her computer was infected with a company that had been a partner of Google. So I went back to Google after the Christmas break and I said, we have to stop this. We never, ever want to partner with any sort of malware or negative provider or anything like that. 
And I'm very proud that Google has taken a strong stand. We try not to show ads. We try not to work with anyone who might be infecting someone's computer. We also make Chrome, which is not only fast, but protects users' computers by flagging malware and potential spyware and viruses. And we even mark potential hack sites and spyware in our search results. One last thing is that if we didn't have Google, I think people would be a little bit slower. So I've been in Korea for a few days now. I've, I've gotten to take a tour of some palaces, uh, museums, uh, really gotten to see a lot of the sites. And I realized that there's this culture of poly poly, of speed. Um, I was in my hotel and I needed to get this shirt clean so that it would be nice for everyone so I wouldn't, uh, it wouldn't be dirty. And the phone in the hotel has a button that says instant service. And so you just pick it up and it was 10 o'clock at night. And I said, okay, I, I, I need to get this shirt clean. And they were very apologetic. They said, I'm, I'm sorry, it's going to take until tomorrow morning. <laughs> and I was like, okay, that's, that's fantastic. I wasn't expecting it in just a few hours. Right? South Korea is fantastic for speed. Things get done very quickly. We care about speed at Google, too. If we can't return the search results to you in under 500 milliseconds, in under half of a second, we consider that a failed search. In addition, I worked in the ads group for over a year. Now, at Google, typically the engineers who work on search quality never talk to the engineers who work on ads. They, they even sit in different buildings. It's as if they're almost in different companies. But the ads group had a really good practice. They said, unless the ads are ready, we're not going to make the users wait to get the search results. So let me say that again. If your search results have been finished, they're ready to go, but we don't know what the ads should be, we're never going to make you wait for the ads. We go ahead and show the search results to you. And I think that's a really good practice. People are in a hurry. If you're in the subway on your phone and you're doing a search, you don't want to wait for the ads. You want to get the information quickly. You want to move on. And so I think that emphasis on speed has been something that we've cared about a very much amount at Google. So that's a little bit about the history of search, about the evolution of search. Let me talk about how search is today, how it works, and a few things that you might want to know about search engine optimization. The first thing that you need to know is that search is actually very hard. We have seen well over one trillion URLs on the web. One trillion, so 1,000 billion different URLs. The web is huge. Finding the right information is like finding a grain of sand on the beach. It's extremely difficult to find the right grain of sand. In addition, over one billion searches a day come to Google, every single day. If it's a slow day, it's still well over a billion. If it's a fast day, it can be even much, much higher. But no matter what, we have so many searches coming in that we have to be able to do it as quickly as possible. And finally, there are people who try to cheat. There are people who try to rank higher than they should or who try to abuse users' trust. And those people make over a million spam pages every hour. Now, the net result of all of this is that we have to do as much as we can with computers. If you remember, I talked about Yahoo, and I talked about how they compiled a list of links by hand. That approach can never scale 100% all the way up to the web. So what Google tries to do is it tries to figure out how it can handle as much of its searches with computers. Because computers can work 24-7, computers don't get tired, you don't have to give computers the day off. Computers will run the same program the same way every time, and they don't get you know, biased, they don't have a particular point of view. So I wanted to talk a little bit, given that we do use computers, about how we change the computer programs that we use. It turns out it's a pretty involved process. We do a lot of work 
to try to make sure that we return the best possible search results. It all starts out with an idea. An engineer has an idea. Over 20,000 ideas last year alone. Some of them are pretty good ideas. Sometimes they don't make sense. But the next thing that you do when you have an idea is you start out and you implement it in a test sandbox. That is, you test it out before you try it on real users. When that happens, if it looks pretty good, we have an entire group of thousands of raters and we show them the search results before the change and after the change. And they don't know which one is new. So it's like a blind taste test to decide whether a change is good or not. If the change still looks good because people tend to like the new results, even though they don't know which one is the new one, but they tend to pick the set of search results that they like, then we actually send that out to a small percentage of real users. So if you have used Google in the past, maybe to do deep research, there's at least a chance that we've looked at the clicks on the search results to help us make Google search quality better. Now, we try out over 10, over 20,000 search experiments every year, but what we end up doing gets compiled into a report, and every week we evaluate that report, and then we decide how many to launch. Let me just very briefly show you some stats. <coughs> so these are numbers from 2009, but the proportions, the rough percentages are about the same. We would try out anywhere from 10 to 20,000 ideas. Of that, many more thousand, 8,549, we would send to these blind <coughs> side-by-sides. And then a smaller fraction of that actually get it sent out to real users and to see whether users tend to click on the newer results or tend to click on the older results. And the final number of changes that we launched last year was 585. That means we change how Google ranks its search results more than once a day. Every single day, we're looking for ways to improve how we rank our search results. And we never stop that process. It's always going on. Once you work at Google, you start to notice any time you do a search and you don't find the exact result that you're looking for. And then you end up filing that away and you're going to send an email and ask, how can we make that search better? So I wanted to cover in just three slides, if you wanted to rank better in global search engines, here are the tips and the tricks that you would want to know. There's basically only three slides of material here. But if you are comprehending of this knowledge, you will know more than probably 80% of people who make websites. On this slide, I just want to cover the basics. You want to make your site crawlable by search engines. Now, how do you do that? The first step is just to make sure that you give permission to the search engines. So there is a very well-known standard known as robots.txt. And if you allow search engines to crawl using this robots.txt, then they can enter your site. Otherwise, it's as if you've put up a sign that says, you're not allowed to enter. So the very first step, once you decide you'd like to be crawled, is to allow search engines to crawl in robots.txt. The next thing to do, you can actually do at home or at work using any web browser. And the idea is just to click on links and make sure that you can find all the different pages of your site. For example, if you have to do a search in a web form, search engines might not know how to do that search. So the way to get around that is to offer links at the bottom that show you where you can click to reach each of the amounts of information. So, Simply by testing things out, by clicking links, you can find all of the pages on your site. That means your site should be discoverable in search engines. It should be able to be crawled. The next thing to bear in mind is to try to use standard HTML. So you saw in the last presentation by Jun Yong that if you use Flash, then if you have an iPhone, you just can't see that site. 
because the iPhone doesn't know how to interpret Flash. If you can use standard HTML, that makes it much easier for search, instant, search engines to interpret your site. So for example, most search engines won't know what to do with ActiveX or asynchronous JavaScript, also known as AJAX. So if you can use standard HTML5 technology rather than Flash or AJAX or ActiveX, or at least use less of that, use it for you know, pictures in the middle, but make sure that the navigation is standard static HTML links. That way every person and search engine can discover your site. So those are the basics. Here's just one or two more slides about search engine optimization. This slide is about the text that you put on your, on your site. You would not believe how many web pages have a title that just says untitled or they don't have any title at all or the title of the page is exactly the same on every single page of the site. Whenever anyone does a search and they see the snippet for your web search result, the snippet that they see will be determined by your title and in many cases your meta description. So in many ways it's like if you were walking by a shop and the shop had an inviting glass display with lots of things that you can see versus whether it was boarded up. Now, if you see something that's very inviting, like if users see a title that looks interesting and useful to them, or if they see a meta description that says, this is going to be the information that you need, then they're more likely to click through and find the information on your website. So it makes a really big difference to make sure that you have page titles and descriptions. It's amazing what even that can do as far as making sure that users click through to your site. Jun Young also mentioned that a lot of people use pictures of text rather than the text itself. We've seen this over and over again to the point where Google has joked internally that we should try to run optical character recognition on images to try to figure out what the text is in various pages. But the fact is, if you include the text yourself, rather than just pictures or pictures of text, then we actually have words to index. The last bit of information about what text you should put on your page is to think about users and what they will type. So for example, suppose I wanted to know how high is Nemson Tower? What would I type? I would type how high is Nemson Tower? But somebody else who's making the web page might say, Namsun Tower is this high. And so users will often type different things than what the webmaster will put on their web page. We try, to help web we try to help users out. So if you type automobile and the web page has car, we'll try to return that web page because we know about synonyms. But if you could put the words on your page directly, that makes it work much better. Now, I'd like to try an experiment. I don't know if this will work, and I haven't warned the translators that this was going to happen, so I don't know how well this will go off. But let's give it a try. In my pocket, I have a device. You guys have probably all seen one of these before, right? You put it into your computer, you can store things on it, images, pictures, files. What would you call this device? Lots of different answers. I heard USB stick. What did someone else say? Flash, flash drive. Anything else? Memory stick, thumb drive, two gigabytes. There's so many different words that people could use for this. Now, I, I don't know how it works in Korean. It might be you all have the exact same word for this. But in English, people could type five or 10 different things if they were searching for this one product. So it's a very simple analogy. If you had a web page and you were selling USB sticks, you'd want to use all of the words to describe it. You'd say, this is a premium quality flash drive. If you haven't seen this thumbstick before, 
It's a retractable tip. It has two gigabytes of storage. And when you use this flash drive, you'll find that it easily serves up the pictures and files. Now, in just three sentences of text, I've gotten four or five different synonyms for thumb drive, USB stick, flash drive. I haven't done it in a way that's artificial. It's not spammy. It's helpful because it describes all the different ways of, this, you know, of using this particular product. It's amazing to me how many people will use specialized, very technical terms, and they won't think about what a real user will type when they're looking for information. If you make something that's interesting or useful, people will want to talk about it. And so the best way to get links, in my experience, is to come up with something excellent, an interactive feature, or some kind of research that people haven't seen before, pictures, the kinds of things that people want to send to friends, they want to bookmark, they want to come back to, they want to tell people about. Any of that can be compelling content. It could be a video. But whatever it is, that's the kind of thing that can cause people to want to link to your site. It's also pretty interesting that social media can amplify your message. There's a lot of people on Facebook. There's a lot of people on Twitter, Sidewall, right? So you can get the word out in lots of different ways whenever you have new material. It can be extremely useful to build up a following because if you engage in conversations with the people who read your site, then they're more interested and they want to share your content with other people. So we have seen times where someone can do a single tweet and from that tweet, tens of thousands of people will visit the site and view the site. So social media can be a wonderful way to help spread your message. And um, I'll do a little bit of a, a plug and just mention that Google provides free tools for webmasters google.co.cr slash webmasters. I think we'll be showing a demo later today of webmaster tools. But it's a very simple system that shows you how fast your site is, how responsive it is, if we know about errors on your site, if we ever detect that your site might have been hacked or have malware, we'll send you a message directly so that you can be alerted of it. There's all sorts of great free information in Google's webmaster tools, and we try to make that available. Okay, so that's a little bit about the past of search and a little bit about how search is today. Let's talk a little bit about the future of search and what to expect. Larry Page would like to say that the perfect search engine understands exactly what you mean and gives you back exactly what you want. So, for example, I don't speak German. But what if I had a long layover in Germany on the way back from Korea? And as a result, I wanted to go ride in the subway. Well, I don't speak any German. I don't recognize German. I don't read German. But wouldn't it be great if I could just point my phone at some German text and it would tell me what that says in English? Or what if I walk up to someone and I want to make sure that I'm getting on the right subway line. Wouldn't it be great if I could speak in English? My computer, which is my mobile phone, which I always have with me, could do voice recognition and then could translate that text from English into German or Korean or Spanish. And then it could synthesize that text. And so it could do speech synthesis so that I could talk to anyone in any language, even if I don't speak that language. The fact is, we're not that far from having that. We're pretty close. And the idea that you could drop down in the middle of the world with anybody. I got to go to a country in Africa last year, Tanzania. Very few people in the world speak Swahili. But if your computer can speak Swahili for you, then you're able to talk to anybody in the world. So I think that we're making good progress on that. Google Translate is not perfect, but it's free, and it's only going to get better and better and better. So if you want to know 
what's the direction to the nearest subway station, you can type that in. You can even get it written phonetically. And then once it's translated, you can have it say that aloud. And then if something doesn't translate correctly, you can hover over it to see alternate translations. So a lot of people think about Google as just a search engine. But Google's mission is to organize the world's information and make it universally accessible and useful. Great information is available in every language. Great information is available in Korean. And so the more that Google can do to help surface, to highlight, to display and show all of the great information that exists in Korean, the better off everybody in the entire world will be. This is just a picture to demonstrate where we'll be in a few years. Mobile is already to the point where we pretty much have a net connection wherever we go. And if you could take a picture of a water bottle and figure out, OK, where does this water bottle come from? Is there any nutritional information that I need to worry about? Pretty soon, you'll be able to do that in any language. And we're getting very close to being able to talk to your phone and have it talk back to you in any language. So the future of search is not just going to a desktop computer and typing into a web browser. The future of search is that you will always have a smart computer right next to you. And you've seen this with the incredible growth of mobile phones. Your phones will be able to help you because they'll know more about you, because you choose to give information so that you can get fantastic information back out. Now, one more area about the future of search is that it's not just the exact same list of links for every single person. In an ideal world, if you were to ask about information from uh, you know, just a random person on the street or from a friend, who would you trust more to get your information? You'd probably trust your friend more. So if I were going to use a home router or if I were going to buy concert tickets, I would trust in Yuck and I would ask him for advice. I wouldn't just necessarily talk to any random person. So I showed this picture earlier today and you might not have noticed, but at the very bottom of this page, I have Lewis Gray shared this on Google+. Now we've started out on Google+, but we're actually trying to pull in more information from all across the web. Quora, FriendFeed, Twitter, TypePad, WordPress, all the different places you can find good information on the web, we would like to highlight that information. So when I searched for Korean pop, I found a recommendation from my friend for a specific video. That makes it more likely that I will probably like that particular video. And I don't know whether we want to play it right now, we, we want to save time for questions, but I, I played it last night. And it's a fantastic video. It's exactly the kind of thing that I think is a good introduction for me that could lead to more Korean pop videos. So the future of search is not just far away. It's coming very close. It's mobile. It's being able to understand language better. And it's being able to understand your relationships and highlight things from your friends. One last area is that a lot of people think about search engines almost like they're a black box. They don't know how they work. And I think it's important for all search engines, every global search engine, every major search engine, to talk about how they work and explain more about their policies. In an ideal world, search engines would be transparent. They wouldn't be a black box. So five or six years ago, the fact that my team worked on web spam was confidential. It was a secret. We didn't even really like to talk about the fact that we tackled web spam. But we realized that's not the best policy. The best policy is to explain how Google works so that people understand how search engines work. They know not to be afraid of them. They know their advantages. And they know how to manage public information on the web so that they're not surprised when information shows up in search engines. And I think it's been real progress 
for people to know how search engines work. It can only help if everybody has an idea of the criteria and the different types of signals that search engines use in order to score results. The sorts of things that I talked about earlier in the presentation. The last area that I wanted to talk about is that I would like to close out a little bit by talking about the importance of the open web. Now, before I talk about the open web, let me just say, I think we will have a little bit of time for questions. And I think we will have a little bit of, uh, of a small gift for whoever wants to ask the first one or two questions. So be thinking now if there's a particular question that you'd like to ask. Because the first person who's brave enough, I think we will have a little something for them. I want to give you plenty of time to think about it in case you have any questions about how Google works or anything. So let's talk about the importance of the open web. This is a really interesting slide. Historically, Internet Explorer has done very well in Korea. But according to the most recent stats, and I pulled these statistics literally yesterday, in the last six months, the usage of Google Chrome has more than doubled. Six months ago, in July of 2011, Chrome was about 4.3%. And if you look at the slide now, you can see that in December of 2011, Chrome is at 11.38%. That's important because Chrome is a browser from Google, but it's also a very good browser. It's fast. It fits very well with the poly poly ideas of, South, of Korea. But it's also secure. It protects users. It makes sure that they don't get spyware and, and uh, malware and viruses. Every year, we have a contest in which people try to crack browsers, and they see if they can hack them. And for the last three years, Google Chrome was the only major browser that did not have a security hole get found. So Google has donated money to f people who find security holes so that we can make Google Chrome even more secure. Now, there's another reason why this graph is really interesting and why it's really important. Look at the share of Internet Explorer. In the last six months, it's dropped to about 80%. Now, that is still huge. But if you have a website that relies on ActiveX, or some other technology that only works on Internet Explorer, you're excluding 20% of all of your visitors. So if you have some technology that people can only use Internet Explorer with, one out of every five users is getting annoyed, or is not well served, or is somehow not able to access your website, and they have to go and unload their browser and load up Internet Explorer to use it. So website standards are important. Your website should work in any browser, not just in Internet Explorer, not just in Chrome. But if you build it right, it will work well in Safari, it will work well in Firefox, and it's more likely to work on mobile. You guys have already heard today, mobile is on an incredible upward path. And so if your website is going to be prepared for things like the iPhone, which doesn't have Flash, or other mobile browsers, you want to use standard technologies. So it's absolutely the case that with Chrome above 10%, websites should use open standards. And in fact, you should avoid standards locked to one particular browser. Now, when I talk about the importance of the open web, I'm not just talking about websites and web servers. I'm also talking about being open to search engines. So this was a newspaper article that came out in December in Korea. And it noted that something like half of government websites were blocked from being crawled from search engines. That means that there's a lot of resources that people could discover that they weren't being able to discover. Now, I want to note that there's been a lot of progress, even since this article has come out. So many, many organizations 
have since this article unblocked in robots.txt so that any search engine can come in and find high quality information. So it's not as bad as this article makes it sound anymore, but there's still some progress that could be made on making sure that websites are discoverable and are good resources. If you haven't seen this, this is something called the Khan Academy. I know that in Korea, education is incredibly important. It's vital that people be able to learn from the highest quality resources. And the web is becoming one of the highest quality resources available in the entire world. The Khan Academy is a set of videos and a website that you can use to achieve nearly a college level education for free from anywhere in the world, from home. So this is one guy, his name is Salman Khan, and he was a hedge fund trader. He made money as a banker. And then he said, okay, I'd like to do something that feels a little more meaningful with my life. And he was teaching his cousins math. And because it was a lot of trouble, he made these videos so that they could review the videos anytime they wanted. And he would call them on the phone. And eventually his cousins said, you know what? I, I don't want to talk to you on the phone. There's a lot of pressure. Just make the videos and then I can watch the videos as often as I need to so I can practice the math. And what really surprised Sal Khan was that a lot of other people started to watch the videos. And so he started to make more of them. And now you can learn all kinds of mathematics, economics, science, many different subjects just from watching these videos. The fact is the web is a fantastic source of information and Korea should be represented as one of those fantastic sources of reputation. Nobody wants to be an island. An island is isolating. An island means that not as much development is happening as could happen. And so I think that there's a message that I'd like to leave for Korea, which is we have a saying in English, and the saying is to punch above your weight. What does that mean? To punch above your weight means you do better than you would expect given the size of someone. So it's someone who is doing a better job than you would expect. I think Korea is one of those companies that punches above its weight. It represents itself so well on the international stage. The World Cup, the G20, the Olympic Games that already happened, the Olympic Games that will happen in 2018. Korea has so much to be proud of. Korea is number one in the world in broadband penetration. Korea is number one in the world in getting information to people via broadband. I think the only area where Korea doesn't punch above its weight, at least not yet, is getting its information out to the rest of the world. Korea is fantastic at providing good broadband, at providing wonderful things that it should be proud of, but if Korea could do a little bit more so that if people wanted to learn about Hangul, if people wanted to learn about writing resources, if people wanted to learn about the official sunshine policies and, and the successes of President Kim, there's so much great stuff that Korea can tell the world. And so I, I think it will be fantastic if that information is available to the entire world. So I hope that, that everybody has found this talk a little bit useful that people have enjoyed hearing a little bit about the past of search engines, how search engines work today, and how to do better in search engines with search engine optimization, what the future of search might look like, and then how important it is for Korea to represent itself on the international stage so that if anybody wants to find more information about how great Korea is, anybody can find it. Okay, with that, you can see this is me. <laughs> I got to do a little bit of tourism on the weekend and it was a lot of fun. Um, 
With that, I would love to take any questions that people have. I think we've got just a few minutes if anybody's interested. And I think we do have at least a couple small things for the first one or two or three people who wanted to ask questions, if anybody is interested at all.